Has everyone read their preparation for? We have with us this morning, Reverend, there it is. We have with us this morning. <laughs> oh, man. Reverend Ed Sladak, who is not a, a stranger to us. He's been here quite a few times. At this time, Ed, it's all yours. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Would you join with me in our call to worship? Let us go in heart and mind to see what has come to pass. Let us go with the Let us go with the shepherds. Let us go with the wise men. Let us go with God's promise for us. Let us go with the poor and humble. Let us go with our King, born of the Holy Maker. Let us go with all the world, with all the peoples of the nations. Come, let us worship. Come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Amen. Let us stand and sing number hymn number 23. Today we join, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Today we join the generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. 
Today's reading is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the skies. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all the armies of heaven. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he has issued his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Praise the Lord from the earth, all people. Praise the name of the Lord, for his name is very great. His glory towers over the earth and heaven. He has made his people strong, honoring his faithful ones who are close to him. Has mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Come all you who are struggling, come all you who are crippled by pain and suffering. Come to stand before God who gives forgiveness. Let us offer our honest confessions to God who sets us free and gives us a new life. We were heaven with sorrow. We were deep in the night. We were silent with sadness. We were hardened by conflict. We were afraid of the darkness. We were haunted by fears. This is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste, bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. We were arrogant and angry. We were cruel and uh, clumsy. We were selfish, narrow, greedy. We were doubtful and confused. We were strangers without a country. We were children far from home. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Let's take a moment for a silent prayer of reflection. Amen. The God who promised never to leave us or forsake us has come to us in Jesus Christ, who binds up the brokenhearted, heals all of our infirmities, and leaves, relieves our burden of sin. So rise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Thanks be to God. Let us share a moment of God's abundant love with each other.
I bring you greetings from my wife, Betty, who I can happily say is not in the hospital or recovering from being in the hospital. It's, uh, it's nice to have her uh, uh, healthy and running around the house and unfortunately telling me a lot of things I have to do. But that was always there to begin with. She would be here this morning except for two things. She's a Sunday school teacher. Uh, I am as well, but they don't mind if I'm not there, but they do mind if she's not there. And she also counts the money uh, with another person after worship. And as we all know, we, we clergy know, it, it, that's very important. It's very important to count the money. Today we're going to look at a, a, a passage that the lectionary has for us this Sunday. It is, it is it, when you look at it, it, it looks kind of a straightforward, easy kind of passage to preach on. However, it is not. It's quite complex. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, our good shepherd, by the leading of your spirit, help us to listen for your voice and follow in your paths all the days of our lives. Open up your word, Father. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Every year, his, Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boys stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed. They were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went to Nazareth to, uh, with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The Word of God. I cannot imagine the terror that must have seized the heart of Mary to find that her son was missing. But as we know, she would see far worse things happen to her son in the years ahead. The Gospels make it very clear that none of his disciples, not even the ones closest to him, ever quite figured him out this side of Pentecost, which meant that he spent his whole earthly ministry that can only be a whole earthly ministry with not even one person fully understanding him. Now, to some extent, that happens to all of us. But we can only begin to imagine the riddle that Jesus presented to his followers. It seems to be built into the human psyche, as long as the going is good, we'll go along, we'll get along, we'll believe, we'll, we'll, we will withhold our doubts. <clears throat> Pardon me. But once the going gets rough, and in the case of Jesus, it got very rough, well then, we're not so sure anymore. Doubts and confusion plague us, and we wonder if God knows what he's doing. It's hard to be faithful when you're looking up at a cross and seeing your Messiah bleeding to death in agony. There is a reason why theologians call the cross God forsaken. Of all of his followers, we seldom consider the one who was there right to the end, Jesus' own mother. For Mary, just as for Jesus, the crucifixion represents the culmination of a theme, as one author put it, a theme which had been growing within her experience for some time, the complete statement of a tragic melody heard up until now only in fragments. Consider the path which Mary had walked. 
As a faithful Jewish girl, there could be no doubt that Gabriel's announcement would indicate to her the birth from her womb of the Messiah who would liberate his oppressed people. How much she understood of Simeon's warning in the temple that a sword would pierce her soul, we cannot say. We then meet her in the passage we just read in, in the three-day agony of having lost her 12-year-old boy. No parent here will miss the sickening panic in that simple narrative. A day's walk away from Jerusalem and all is well. Then suddenly, where is he? Isn't he with you? I thought he was with you. Oh, he must be around here somewhere. Hasn't anybody seen him? Where, where is he? The frantic rush back to Jerusalem, all thought of festival and holidays suddenly vanished. Then three days, think of it, three days of looking for him in Jerusalem. Amidst the conmen and the pickpockets and the soldiers and the prostitutes, the merchants, priests, drunks, and somewhere like a needle in a haystack, an innocent 12-year-old boy from a country town. He's only 12. How can he be all right? Where has he been staying? And, and the last place, the last place they think of looking is the place where it matters. There he sits, surrounded by the graybeards, listening to them and asking them questions in the temple of God. He is old enough to be precocious, even while he is young enough to be precious to his mother. Son, she says, we, your father and I, have sought you, sought you, sorrowing, as the King James translation puts it. I always used to read during Christmas time all of the Christmas stories in, King, in the King James version of the Bible. And everybody there that is, was, is my age or older would always shake their heads. Yes, I remember that. Some days I really miss that translation because of its beauty and its, and its way of articulating in poetry. We have sought you sorrowing. And all those replies she gets is that he is about his father's business, an implied rebuke to her mention of Joseph, his father. Jesus has to be there, don't you know, debating with the learned in the temple, growing up in wisdom and stature and in favor with both men and God. How is it, mother, that you don't know? Thus begins a lifelong dialogue between the two. The puzzle only deepens as he grows up further, meeting her, rude with, meeting her with rude shocks. Woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Who are my mother and my brothers? Anyone who does the will of God is my mother, my sister, my brother. Mary looks on in that strange and beautiful scene at the wedding of Cana in Galilee while Jesus answers the need she expresses but re rebukes her for expressing it. Later she comes from with her other sons to find Jesus in the crowd at a tavern asking for him, wanting to find him. Son, we have sought you sorrowing. And all the answers she gets is that as far as he's concerned, family ties are not important in the kingdom of God. What kind of son is this? What kind of Messiah is that? Mary has to watch in horror as her well brought up son takes up with the most disreputable people rabble in town. He makes friends with the people on the wrong side, with people of the wrong sort. He gets on easy terms with the Quislings, the taxmen who were collaborating with the occupied forces. He seems to exercise a strange fascination and attraction for young women of, of uh, not such reputable reputation. And as we meet Mary at the foot of the cross years later where she again has sought him sorrowing, and now she finds him at last. So this is where all this has led, she thinks to herself to the shame and humili humiliation of a crucifixion. He has run away again. She thought she knew him, and now she finds that she doesn't. He is the prodigal son off in the far country, wasting his spiritual treasure with harlots, feeding his pearls to the swine, to the unclean rabble, to murderers and thieves, the ones who bracket him on Calvary. Son, we have sought you sorrowing, 
And despite the modesty of the paintings and crucifixes, it is a fact that men were crucified naked, a matter of shame to the Jews for whom nakedness was an indecent pagan havoc when playing sport, and a double shame to the Jewish mother for whom the circumcision of her firstborn had been the proudest day in her life. Think of the Magnificat. Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit exalts in my Savior. Now think of this in the minor key. My soul is in pain before the Lord. My spirit is in anguish in God, my deceiver. The taunts directed at Jesus cut into her too. If you are the mother of God, bid him now come down from the cross. All generations will call you blessed. Gabriel had never warned her about this, never let on that this sort of thing was going to happen, never let, you know, telling her a secret about the big things of God. He never let her know that the disaster was part of the whole experience of having Jesus as her son. With all that love, who would have thought there could be such pain? What is the relationship between love and pain anyway? Everything. I'm in the process of reading a 600-page book over Christmas. My wife says, this is a hobby. And I said, yes, this is really good. It is about the atonement and about the reality that in Christ, pain and freedom and love come in the same person. There is no love ultimately without pain. That is the rare thing. That is the real thing that we all know in life. In Mary is focused sharply the pride and the hope of Israel, and now the disappointment and the horror of Israel. Here was the one to redeem God's people. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The agony Jesus experiences on Palm Sunday, weeping over Jerusalem, even while the crowds are singing hosannas, is acted out by Mary on Good Friday, weeping over her son as the crowds are yelling for his blood. Hasn't she known all along that he was sailing close to the abyss, keeping such disreputable company, offending the scribes and the Pharisees, challenging the sacred law of God in respect to the kosher regulations and Sabbath principles? What did he think he was doing? He was supposed to be upholding and vindicating Israel, not tearing down Israel's uh, institutions. Maybe she had been wrong too. Maybe she had just imagined Gabriel's visit. Maybe it was just wishful thinking. After all, who heard of a God, even Israel's God, actually being born as a baby? And didn't, even, and didn't every Jewish girl dream of becoming the mother of the Messiah? Maybe she had just let her dreams get away from her. If Jesus presents us with an unfathomable figure in the Gospels, so does Mary. They both present an enigma, a mystery. Here is a woman full of grace to be blessed indeed by all generations to be called, as her cousin Elizabeth said, the mother of my Lord. And then by the later church, she was called Theotokos, the God-bearer, mother of God. But Mary is, thorough, is a thoroughly human being, shy, sharing the misconceptions and the puzzles and the consequent pain of the Jewish people of her day, whom as the Messiah's mother she represents. She has given birth to the Redeemer of the world, but how is he to redeem the world? And what will she feel when that comes about? There is a sword in her heart also. We need to go back to that scene once more of the Passover when Jesus was 12 years old. In my mind's eye, I can see Luke's painting of the scene on campus. Jesus sits off, uh, off center to the left. The gray beard doctors and scribes sitting around him so that the eye is drawn to him on one side. But the young Jesus is looking away from them to the other side of the picture. And in the foreground to that side, there rush in Mary and Joseph, their faces a mixture of three-day exhaustion, worry, relief, anger, and love and bewilderment as they burst into the scene of tranquil scholarship. And as the two, Mary and Jesus, fix their eyes on, upon one another, a third image is born with the words, how is, it that, how is it that you did not know? 
Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? It is the sort of picture which demands that you sit back and look at it again. You will not easily exhaust its strange power, even when the tension relaxes and Jesus goes home like a good boy and grows up in wisdom and stature and in favor with God, with God and men. Some biblical scholars believe that Mary not only represented Israel, but she also represents the whole world, the world which yearns and groans for redemption. The world that groans for justice and putting things right. The world yearns for compassion and love and tenderness. The Bible tells us that Jesus came into the world and the world was made through him, but the world knew him not. Mary, how is it that you did not know? He came to his own and his own received him not. Mary, how is it that you didn't know? This is how it always was and how it always will be until the day when every knee shall bow at his name. He is that for which Israel longed, for which the world longs, and yet his coming seems to bring not joy but only pain. The Jews knew, to the, knew this to the extent that one of the great pictures for the arrival of the last days, the days of redemption, the, day, the year of our Lord, the, was the powerful and shocking image of a woman in the act of giving birth. It is an image which speaks of great hope, the promise of new life, but also it speaks just as powerfully, especially to the ancient world with their, with, uh, their not very sophisticated medical uh, science. It speaks of the risk and fear of sharp and terrible pain, of forces suddenly unleashed, which through life-giving intent seems to carry death at their heart. Mary, Called to be the God-bearer is called to take upon herself the labor pains of the new age. Not at Bethlehem only, but in Jerusalem at Passover time, and not at once, but twice at the climatic points of her whole life. Every time Jesus came into her life, there was pain. We are not told that she said anything as she stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus, we are told, gives her to his beloved disciple to care for her in his place. She is about to have another three days of agony, mourning the loss of Israel's hope and consolation. Another three days before love's bright pain will fill her life, as before it f filled her body, not of the will of men, but of God. But the essence of the scene is encapsulated in the book, in the look that passes between the son we can't quite figure out and the mother who is equally a mystery to us. It is the look where the son, where son we have sought you sorrowing meets how is it that you did not know? And the meaning of it all is not found by ignoring or bypassing the bitterness and puzzle and doubts, but by looking deep within this scene. Here he is, here is your disappointment, your runaway son. Did you not know that he must be about his father's business? Arguing with love and pain and reconciling them? Lifted up in wisdom and stature and in anguish both of God and man. How, how does love come by death? Each one of us here is called to be a God bearer. We too, this side of Pentecost, carry this paradox of love and pain and creative tension in the mystery of our faith and in the mystery of our Savior. We are here in this new and scary version of the world, and right now it seems to be especially scary, called to be those through whom God's redeeming love will still come to birth in the world. For that reason, because of the model we have in Mary, we are not to be amazed at the same time a sword should pierce our own hearts. This is by no means a sign that we are on the wrong road. On the contrary, it is when we share the groaning of all creation that according to the Apostle Paul, we hear the spirit groaning yet deeper within us, assuring us that we are children of God, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Jesus. Better to be puzzled by Mary at the strange things that Jesus is doing to me than settle for an easily grasped half-truth faith with neither depth or power. 
We are called to be bearers of God in Christ to his world. Pondering in our hearts the mysteries that we do not yet understand. Seeking him in and through our own sorrow, ready to search for our own young Lord, wherever that may be found. Whether dis discussing with the learned or parting with the riffraff riff or dying with the outcast. Today we come to the scene before us and we are asked, how is that we did not know? Lord, we have sought you sorrowing. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the agony of Mary, teach us to see your hand at work. Not only in our joy, but also in our pain. Not only in our victories, but in our defeats. Not only in our strength, but also in our weakness. Not only in our hopes, but in our disappointments. Not only in our lives, but in our deaths. That we may believe in the love revealed on Calvary. And believing may know your peace, which passes all understanding. Through Jesus Christ, your crucified Son, we pray. Amen. Would you join with me now as we sing hymn number 53, What Child Is This? Let it stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Beloved, do not worry about anything, but in everything let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the insurance of this promise, let us confidently offer ourselves to God, God, knowing that God has already provided all that we need. Let us give generously to the Lord. <laughs> Receive our offerings of thanks and our hearts of love and devotion. Amen. Among our prayer concerns this morning is prayer has been asked for Richard uh, Denny, Dick Denny, who is struggling with cancer. We ask that you pray for Barb Morris, who had a stroke last week. And Elijah will be three Monday. Praise God. Are there other prayer concerns? Kathy Her father passed away. <clears throat> Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have never abandoned your children. You have promised us that you would be close in your spirit. You promised that you would watch over our nations and our leaders. You have sought us out when we were alone and afraid. You have loved us in times when we were not particularly lovable. You have died for us. 
and called us worth it. You have shared your largesse and your love with us, blessings beyond our comprehension. You have asked us to share with you in prayer those who are in need of healing and salvation. And we lift all the people up we have spoken of today. We ask, Lord, that you will be with Pastor Tom and Julie on, on their holiday. We ask that they will rest up. Father, for all the things that you have given us, especially here at First Presbyterian, we know that you love us and you care for us. Watch over us, Lord, so that we might be your witness to the world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Do you stand for our closing hymn? Good Christian friends rejoice. has told you what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. May the love of God surround you, the wisdom of Christ guide you, and the power of the Holy Spirit encourage you as you joyfully proclaim our world belongs to God. Amen. Have a great day.